Hello and welcome to the next installment of searching for my next daily driver. Now I know there's no debate whether or not the back seats of the new RS6 are practical for Isofix or any other occupants. But in the interests of continuity, I began this series in the back seats of other contending cars and I intend to keep that theme continuing. So let's take you for a walk and talk around the features of this beautiful launch edition RS6 before taking you for a drive and chatting about why this could well be my next daily driver. And so here it is, the launch edition Navara Blue Audi RS6. Uh, as a launch edition car, it's actually limited in this specification to 110 vehicles for the UK. And what does the launch edition consist of? Well, first of all, the black pack. So elements like these, these air intakes here, these vertical blades, they are blacked out. This front splitter here gets blacked out. We have this side sill insert. All of that gets blacked out. Wing mirror caps are blacked out. Importantly, the surrounds around the window. So these could otherwise be chrome or silver. Roof rails, they are a matte black, really nice finish. Coming around to the rear is where I think the majority of the difference is made. It's all about this rear diffuser and splitter which surrounds these optional sports exhausts. So both the splitter here is black and as part of the optional sports exhaust, you also get black tips as well as a better sound, which I shall share with you shortly. And then let's talk about one of the most imposing features on the outside of this car, which is the massive wheels. So these are 22 inch wheels. They're diamond cut, super imposing. They look incredible and they are shod in low profile rubber. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that this launch edition car is heavily optioned, it is running the standard steel brakes. Now, they still have the 10 cylinder or 10 pot brake calipers. And what is unique to the launch edition is that those brake calipers are painted red, but they are still running standard steel discs, which we shall discuss when we go for a drive shortly. But the red calipers on the launch edition look really good. Interesting fact, if you spec the carbon ceramic brakes, that also lifts the restriction on the car and you can get yourself up to almost 200 miles an hour. And then exclusive launch edition parts aside, let's just talk about the overall platform as a whole. First of all, the styling. Look at the stance and squat on this car. If I just step out from the side so you can see the bulge of that arch, look at the rear arches. They are so flared. And then we've got these incredible headlights. These come standard on all RS6s. They actually have been inherited from the RS7. Uh, these are HD matrix LED lights. They project light down the road as if you've got a football stadium of lighting behind you. It is an amazing thing to witness and really helps when you're getting on it quickly at nighttime. Then of course you've got the new design language from the front grille, which is incredibly imposing. Nothing quite says, get out of my way, please, <laughs> as an RS6 behind you. They've got such road presence. And then of course, one of the whole reasons that you would be interested in this car really is the practicality and therefore the size of the massive boot. It is huge. You can also drop the seats obviously to fit more in. I quite like the fact that you can drop the seats using these pull handles here so you don't have to go on the inside to latch them down. Uh, there's also these rails here which come standard now on most Audis in terms of optional extras you can buy that slot into that like nets and bars in order to you know keep things like shopping and parcels in place should you be transporting anything. So massively practical, big huge boot and that really the fact that that space there is connected to one of the finest twin turbocharged V8s on the market right now is a fantastic thing in itself. So more on that when we go for a drive. Let's close that down and then I think we should take a look on the inside. Okay, inside the car. The cockpit in here has evolved incredibly since the previous generation C7 RS6. Uh, first of all, let's start with the two screens in the central console here. The top half, and again, these are all touch sensitive, touch screens with uh, haptic feedback. Uh, haptic feedback meaning there isn't actually any buttons or physical components on these screens, but when you do touch them, it sends this reassuring vibration and feedback to let you know that you have interacted with a button, despite the fact that there's not actually one there. I quite like as well intuitive features like this, instead of having to go up and down in terms of temperature, which is fine when we're static right now, but when you're driving, you can just swipe across like that and just scroll up and down. That's nice. It's an easy function as well. Uh, same applies for the uh, fan speed. You don't have to tap it if you don't want to. You can swipe along and just scan up and down. 
pretty sweet stuff. And then in front of us, we have where it, the magic happens. So flat bottom steering wheel, uh, and in front we have an all digital instrument display, uh, which you can scroll through to show everything from sat nav to your phone connection. Right now I've got a G meter up here, uh, which is fun for when you're putting the performance of this car through its paces. Uh, speaking of performance, uh, when you're in a RS mode, uh, let's just see if we can do this, Audi drive select here. Yes, these are great. So here there are two modes which you can pre-configure to your settings. So in RS1, what I've done is set up everything else to be dynamic. So drive system, dynamic, suspension, comfortable, and everything else should be on dynamic, pronounced, or sport. So effectively, I've got everything on there which can be on sort of high alert in that mode, except for the ride quality, which I want in soft, because the British B-roads, which I spend the most of my time on, aren't that great, but I still want that faster throttle response, gear shift, handling, etc. So that's nice. Now, once you've saved that, you don't have to go in to this menu in order to activate it. That RS1 and RS2 buttons get saved to this RS mode button on your steering wheel here. So you press once for RS1, and as you can see the, the screen there changes, second for RS2, and then third time and it will go back to normal. And it's just a great way of jumping quickly to the settings that you want, uh, depending on your personal driving preference. Pretty cool stuff. And then of course there are the standard pre-configured modes which uh, Audi have configured during the development of this car. Efficiency, comfort, auto, and dynamic, as the, the names are fairly self-explanatory, uh, but effectively dynamic, that goes everything extreme and stiff and reactive. Efficiency, um, things like uh, cylinder on demand will kick in earlier in order to get uh, more miles per gallon out of your longer journeys. And then things like comfort and auto, uh, fairly self-explanatory. One really chilled gentleman's express and auto adapts to how you're driving at any given time. So you can go from comfort to dynamic by effectively changing your driving style. So that's pretty cool as well. Now then, this is cool, particularly if you like to drive your RS as an RS was intended to be driven. Um, this is a temperature and condition indicator of the uh, important attributes and elements of your car. What I particularly like is that it will give you the specific brake disc temperature. So when you are driving it, there's these different brackets here, everything from unavailable, which is effectively when the car hasn't yet read the condition of an individual component, all the way through up from cold, warm, hot, and overheated, warm being the optimum temperature. So as you can see, I've just driven here. So the radiator and drivetrain are warm, engines cold, uh, brakes are cold, and sports diff as well is also cold. It just gives you a really interesting overview as to the uh, critical components of the car. So if you do need to back off or equally uh, warm it up before you get on it. This is a really nice map to show you what's what. You'll also notice down here the heated seat option and the cool seat option. Now, not a big deal in luxury cars generally, but this is the first RS6 where you can spec sports seats. So they look great and hold you in tightly when you're driving it spiritedly. But there's also the option to have a sports seat and cooling and heated seats. That wasn't an option which was available on the previous generation car. So that's also a nice bonus. And then down here in the little cubby hole under the armrest, uh, there is the added functionality of wireless charging, which also brings me on to the fact that on here you can have wireless Apple CarPlay. So we know it looks fantastic. Does it have the drive to back it up? I mean, the way this thing gathers momentum is absurd. You'll hear me bang on about torque quite a lot on this channel. The reason being, we get so fixated with horsepower, and horsepower is obviously an important figure, but it's that it's the torque that gives you that sensation of thrust. It's the feeling that presses you back into your seat, condenses your diaphragm, and makes you turn to the camera and go, flippin' heck, that's got some go. And on the right cars, I often say that you can almost separate the feeling of horsepower from torque. When you depress your right foot, you can feel the engine spinning up, spooling up, approaching its maximum rev range, and that's what the horsepower is all about. But the torque is that thickness underfoot, which is almost a tangible, malleable energy that propels you down the road. This is one of those few cars where you can feel those 
distinct differences in power, horsepower, and torque. It is such a solid foundation of power in this car that, dare I say it, when you find yourself in a village like this, where you respectfully need to keep yourself in check and adhere to the speed limits, just the slightest brush of throttle just generates so much propulsion that you do actually have to make a conscious effort to keep your car on the speed limit when you're in these really low speed zones. It honestly it gathers momentum with such ease, it's crazy. But then, when you break out of said speed restricted village and out into the open roads like so, honestly, the way this pulls is mind blowing. Now on paper, and this is why it's important to talk about the torque, is that this actually has the same amount of horsepower as the outgoing C7 generation RS6, which had 600 horsepower. This has exactly the same as that. However, it has 100 newton meters of torque more. Not only that, it is available throughout the whole rev range. So in the previous gen, uh, it seemed to be more mid to top, whereas in this, it it almost feels hybrid assist. It isn't hybrid assist, but the lag is so minimal and the availability of that power is spread across pretty much every single point of the band that it is on tap all of the time. So there's the engine ticked off. Uh, phenomenal power. Now then, what is that powered through? Well, this is where things for me get, I wouldn't go so far as to say sloppy, but it's let down just a little bit. 5% of the gearbox for me is a bit of a letdown. I say 5% because the majority of the time when you're living with this car daily on roads like this, it's absolutely fine. In fact, the upshifts are as fast as a twin clutch box. The irony of this situation is that you're going to be buying an RS product Audi because you want to drive it a bit spiritedly. You want to grab it by the scruff of its neck on occasion and really exploit the road that you find yourself on. And that's what the RS moniker is all about. The irony of it is that when you drive this like an RS product under heavy braking and downshifting, because it isn't a twin clutch box, it is a ZF eight speed automatic, the downshifts often aren't there for you when you're going fast. Now, the majority of the time, we're gonna live with these things as daily drivers, it's completely fine. But isn't it funny that, that you're getting the RS to go fast, and when you're driving it like a fast car, the gearbox sort of falls short? I can't help but think if they put a twin clutch in this car, it would actually be the perfect car. Then, from transmission, let's go through to the further extremities of the drivetrain. Of course, this is coming with Quattro all-wheel drive system. Uh, the amount of traction this thing has, in part because of Quattro, the other in part because of evolutions in tyre technology, it's running stickier tyres, really fat rubber on this car, keeping this car planted, but of course it is also a heavy car. So when you've got a two-ton car combined with a Quattro all-wheel drive and the latest generation of tyres, you're gonna have yourself some traction on the tarmac, which means when I drop this down to second gear like this and plant foot, just 100% of traction, 100% of the time. And um, I've been in this car now for a week. Uh, several of those days were in the wet, and it will do exactly the same in the wet as well. Such is the genius of Quattro. Now, in the UK, we're fortunate that, um, as standard, if you were to buy an RS6, uh, for some reason, it comes as standard with rear wheel steer and the RS specific diff, which sends the majority of the power to the rear wheels. It just allows the car to turn in a bit more. When you direct power towards the back and you have rear wheel steering, uh, the agility, the, the combination of agility in this car is astounding. It shouldn't be as agile as this platform is. It's big, it's heavy, and yet it handles like a RS3 almost. It, it feels that compact. It's probably the most aggressive application of rear wheel steering that I've seen. And on top of that, the car is running a 48 volt architecture, meaning the anti-roll system is able to develop more torque than the engine does to keep the chassis level. Now steering, this has the dynamic adaptive steering on it. For me, it's a bit too light. 
um, at the best of times it does lack a spot of connection with the road anyway. Uh, it just feels a little bit synthetic. I actually think that the car would benefit from having a consistent weightier steering feel. Once again, this car is so many things to so many people. And if you're spending time actually going slower in this car and you live in a town, it is quite nice to have that lighter steering rack at times. But again, the irony of it is you're buying the RS because you want the fast one and the fast ones need steering to lean on so you know what the nose is doing. Now brakes. We are, as mentioned at the beginning in the launch edition car, uh, but still this car was not specced with the optional carbon ceramic brakes. Granted, I think that option is around about 8,000 pounds. However, the amount of weight that it sheds off this already substantially heavy car is dramatic, around about 30 kilograms. Think about that, shaving 30 kilograms from the brakes alone. Now this car is uh, still fitted with the 10 piston calipers. That's ridiculous, but it is pincing against steel brakes. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, I've been living with this car for a week. Uh, I'm really fortunate to live around some really great driving roads. And despite the fact that this thing is so heavy and so fast, uh, the brakes have been phenomenal. Now, as petrol heads, we like to play the dream five car garage game, don't we? You know, if you could pick five cars as your complete lineup, off you go, what would it be? For me, an RS6 has most of the time always found its way into that lineup. The reason being is that its breadth of ability is one of the widest in the automotive world. On the one hand, you can drop cogs like this and absolutely launch it and just destroy whatever road you find yourself on with massive performance and traction and stability. But then, if I want to, I can use drive select switch here drop it into comfort mode like so revs drop adaptive three-cylinder air suspension gets softer and all of a sudden it becomes this gentleman's express a grand tour with massive practicality and what that translates to is granddad in the front isofix in the back with son in one seat mother next to son next to mother-in-law with dog in the boot father comes up alongside ferrari decides you're not having that today mate Hold on fam, we're gonna school this child. <laughs> and off you go, into Quattro Oblivion, leaving the man in the Ferrari scratching his head as to how that just happened in a car which is quite clearly seating five people on a family day out with a disgruntled dog with his nose smushed up against the rear window. And there lies the automotive paradox and fantasy that is the RS6. It's a nice uh, place to round this up, really, as always. Thank you so much for watching. I shall drop this cog and make haste. Ciao!